Strong Resistance During the chaotic, murderous fighting in the 8th Marine Zone, Admiral Shibasaki was killed in his blockhouse. The unyielding Japanese commander's failure to provide any backup communications to the above-ground wires, which were destroyed during the preliminary D-Day bombardment, kept him from influencing the battle. The Imperial Japanese archives showed that Shibasaki transmitted one last message to Tokyo early in the morning on D plus two. Our weapons have been destroyed. From now on, everyone is attempting the final charge. May Japan exist for 10,000 years. General Julian Smith arrived on Green Beach just before noon. Smith conferred with Major Ryan and observed the deployment of the three six Marines inland. General Smith realized he was far removed from the main action toward the center of the island. He returned to his landing craft and ordered the coxswain to make for the pier. It was here that the commanding general received his rude welcome to Betio. Major Hayes 18 Marines were besieging the Japanese strong points at the re-entrant, but the Japanese defenders still had control over the approaches to Red Beaches 1 and 2. The defenders' well-aimed machine gun fire disabled Smith's boat and killed his coxswain. The other occupants of his group leaped over the gunwale and into the water. Major Tompkins, the right man in the right place, waded through Japanese fire for a half mile to find the general another LVT. This LVT drew fire and wounded the coxswain, further alarming the remaining occupants. General Smith did not reach Colonel Edson and Shoup's combined command post until 1400. In the meantime, Colonel Edson had assembled his commanders and issued orders to continue the attack to the east that afternoon. The 1-6 Marines would continue along the narrowing south coast, supported by the howitzers and all available tanks from the 110. Colonel Hall would lead two battalions of the 8th Marines and continue advancing along the north coast. Air support and naval gunfire would blast the areas for two hours in advance. Colonel Hall spoke up about his exhausted and decimated Marine landing teams. They'd been in direct contact and ashore since D-Day morning. He told Edson the two landing teams had enough strength for only one more assault and that they must get relieved. Colonel Edson promised to exchange the exhausted 2-8 Marines with the French 2-6 Marines on Bariki at the first opportunity after the assault. The 1-6 Marines started their attack at 1330. They ran into heavy opposition. They took deadly fire from heavy Japanese weapons mounted in turret-type emplacements near the South Beach. While this took 90 minutes to overcome, the light tanks were brave but ineffective. It took sustained 75 mm fire from two Sherman medium tanks to neutralize the Japanese emplacements. Resistance was fierce throughout the zone, and the 1-6 Marines' casualties mounted. They'd taken 800 yards of enemy territory quickly in the morning, but by the long afternoon had attained half that distance. The 8th Marines, after having destroyed their three bunker nemesis, made excellent progress at first, but then ran out of steam after they passed the eastern end of the airfield. Colonel Shoup was right in his estimation that the Japanese defenders, while leaderless, still had plenty of bullets and fight left. Major Crow reorganized his leading elements into defensive positions for the night. He placed one company north of the airfield. The end of the airstrip was covered by fire, but unmanned. On nearby Bairiki Island, the 210 Marines fired artillery missions to support Major Crow. Company B of the 2nd Medical Battalion established a field hospital handling the overflow of casualties. The 2-6 Marines, eager to get into the fight, waited in vain for boats to move them onto Green Beach. Landing craft were mostly unavailable. They were crammed with miscellaneous supplies as the transports and cargo ships continued a general unloading, regardless of the troops' needs ashore. 
Navy Seabees on Betty O were already repairing the airstrip with bulldozers under enemy fire. Occasionally, Marines would call in for help from the Seabees to seal up a bothersome bunker. A bulldozer would arrive and do the job nicely. Shore party Marines and Navy beachmasters on the pier kept the supplies coming in and the wounded going out. Colonel Edson requested a working party at 1552 to clear bodies from around the pier that hindered shore party operations. Later that afternoon, the first jeep got ashore, a wild ride along the pier with every remaining Japanese sniper trying to shoot the driver. War correspondent Sherrod commented, If a sign of certain victory was needed, this is it. The jeeps have arrived. One of Colonel Hall's Navajo Indian code talkers had been mistaken for a Japanese and was shot. This was because of the strain of the prolonged battle. A derelict, blackened LVT drifted on shore, filled with dead Marines. At the bottom of the pile was one Marine who was still alive, still breathing after two and a half days of an unrelenting hell. He looked up and gasped, Water! Pour some water on my face, will you? Shoop, Edson, and Smith were near exhaustion. While the third day on Betty O had been a day of spectacular gains, progress was excruciatingly slow, and the end was not in sight. General Smith sent this report to General Hermley, who had taken his place on the Maryland. Situation not favorable for rapid cleanup on Betty O. Heavy casualties among officers make leadership difficult. Still strong resistance. Many emplacements intact on eastern end of the island. Japanese strong points westward of our front lines within our position have not been reduced. Progress costly and slow. Complete occupation will take at least five days more. Air and naval bombardment a great help, but does not take out emplacements. General Smith took command of operations at 1930. He had 7,000 Marines on shore fighting against 1,000 Japanese defenders. Aerial photographs showed many defensive positions were still intact on Betty O's eastern tail. Smith believed he would need the entire 6th Marines to complete the job. At 2100, the 6th Marines landed. Smith called a meeting to assign orders for D plus 3. The three six Marines would pass through the lines of Major Jones' one six Marines to have a fresh battalion lead the eastward assault. The two six Marines would land on Green Beach and move east to support the three six. All available tanks would be assigned to the three six. Colonel Shoup's second Marines, with the one eight still attached, would continue to assault the Japanese reentrant strongpoints. The remaining 8th Marines would be shuttled to Bairiki. The 410 would land its heavy 105mm guns on Green Beach to increase the Howitzer Battalion's firepower that was already in action. Imperial Japanese soldiers began vicious counterattacks during the nights of D plus 2 and D plus 3. Major Jones believed his exposed forces would be the target for any bonsai attacks and took his precautions. He gathered his artillery forward observers and naval fire control spotters. Jones arranged for field artillery support, starting from 75 yards from his front lines to 500 yards out, where naval gunfire would take over. Major Jones put Company A to the left of the airstrip and Company B on the right along the south shore, while he worried about the 150-yard gap across the runway to Company C he realized there was no solution. Jones used a tank to bring up stockpiles of small arms ammunition, grenades, and water to be kept 50 yards behind the lines. At 1930, the Japanese first counterattack began. Fifty Japanese soldiers snuck past Major Jones' outposts through thick vegetation and penetrated the border between the two companies south of the airstrip. Major Jones' reserve force was composed of his headquarters' cooks, bakers, and admin people. They contained the penetration and killed many Japanese in the two hours of close-in fighting. 
direct, and intense fire from the howitzers of the 110 and 210 stopped the Japanese from reinforcing their penetration. By 2130, the lines were stabilized, and Major Jones placed a company 100 yards to the rear of his lines. All he had left was a composite force of 40 Marines. At 2300, the Japanese attacked Jones' lines again. They made a loud disturbance across from Company A's lines, clinking canteens against their helmets, taunting Marines, and screaming Banzai, while a second force attacked Company B in a silent rush. The Marines repelled this attack, but used their machine guns, revealing their positions. Major Jones requested a full company from the 3-6 to reinforce the second Marines to the rear of the fighting. The third attack came at 0300. The Japanese moved multiple 7.7 millimeter machine guns into nearby wrecked trucks and opened fire on Marine weapons positions. Major Jones called for star shell illumination from the destroyers in the lagoon. A Marine sergeant crawled forward against this oncoming fire to lob grenades into the improvised machine gun nests. This did the job and silenced the battlefield once again. 300 Japanese launched a frenzied attack at 0400 against the same two Marine companies. The Marines repulsed them with every available weapon. Japanese soldiers were caught in a murderous crossfire from the 10th Marine howitzers. Two destroyers in the lagoon, Sigsby and Schroeder, opened up on the Japanese flanks. Waves of screaming attackers took vicious casualties but kept coming. Groups of men locked together in bloodied hand-to-hand -hand combat. PFC Jack Stambaugh of Company B killed three Japanese soldiers with his bayonet before an officer beheaded him with a samurai sword. Another Marine jumped in and knocked out the Japanese officer with his rifle butt. The acting commander of Company B, First Lieutenant Norman Thomas, reached Major Jones on the field phone and said, We're killing them as fast as they come at us, but we can't hold out much longer. We need reinforcements. Major Jones replied, We haven't got them. You've got to hold. The Marines lost 42 dead and 114 wounded in the wild fighting, but they held. In less than an hour, it was all over. The supporting arms never stopped shooting down the Japanese, either attacking or retreating. Both destroyers emptied their magazines of 5-inch shells. The 110 Marines fired over 1,400 rounds that night. As dawn broke, Marines counted over 200 dead Japanese within 50 yards of their lines. An additional 130 bodies laid beyond that range, badly mangled by naval and artillery gunfire. Other bodies laid scattered throughout the Marine lines. Major Jones had to blink back his tears of pride and grief as he walked his lines. One of his Marines grabbed his arm and said, They told us we had to hold and by God, we did.